The Royals lose Game 5 to San Francisco out of the Bay. What will they do uh, in the next coming weeks or coming days coming forward? KU Soccer and KU Volleyball, both with matches over the weekend. We'll see how they fared. And we'll have our Chiefs insider Griffin Hughes break down the Chiefs' win against the Rams this Sunday. All that and more on KU. Uh, good morning, KU. Kansas City fans are feeling a little blue this morning and not in the royal good way. Welcome into Good Morning KU. I'm Jackson Long. Thanks for joining us. Last night, the Yalls dropped Game 5 in San Francisco and now trail in the series three games to two. Shields here in a bit of a jam, bottom of the fourth. Brandon Crawford at the plate for the Giants. He had an earlier RBI to put the team up 1-0. It's now a two-out base hit to center. Dyson can't field it cleanly, and around comes Pablo Sandoval to push the lead to two. Wade Davis in to clean up a little bit of a mess left by Calvin Herrera. Davis hasn't let up a home run all season, and it's just inches away. It's right at the top of the wall. Juan Perez comes around through with a, a pinch hit double. Two more runs score on the play as the Giants cushion their lead. But all they really needed was one. Madison Bumgarner was absolutely nails once again. A thorn in the Royal side in both game one and now here in game five. He throws a complete game shutout. Giants win 5-0 and own a series lead 3-2. Royals get game six and possibly a game seven at the K. That's Tuesday and Wednesday. Ned Yost, always an optimist. We're going back to our home crowd. The place is going to be absolutely crazy. Um, we feel good about our matchups. Um, you know, we're, we've got to walk the tightrope now without a net, you know, but our guys are, uh, you know, our guys aren't afraid of walking the tightrope without a net. You know, we fall off and we're dead. But we win Tuesday, nobody's got a net. It's going to be winner take all. Tuesday's matchup will likely feature Jordana Ventura against Jake Peavy. If game seven is needed, it would be Jeremy Guthrie versus Tim Hudson. A quick note, those were the two matchups, uh, games two and three of this series, that the Royals have won. Friday night was uh, senior night for Kansas soccer team, one of the most accomplished groups in school history. Jayhawks needed nearly all of the 90 minutes to win this one. Liana Salazar scored her second goal of the match in the 86th minute to take a 2-1 lead. Jayhawks outshot the Cyclones 35-10, and the team will head down to Oklahoma to match up against uh, the Sooners in the regular season finale before the Big 12 tournament. KU volleyball action now this Saturday against Texas Tech. The Jayhawks get the sweep of the Red Raiders. There you see 25-14, 25-19, and 25-20. Senior Chelsea Albers, seven blocks, ten kills in the match. Kansas improves to 16-6, and 4-4 four and four in the Big 12 play. Up next, the team heads to Fort Worth to take on TCU this Saturday. The Kansas City Chiefs get another big win Sunday against the St. Louis Rams. We now welcome in our Chiefs insider, Griffin Hughes. Always, to, always happy to have you. Always happy to be here. Well, let's take a look at some of the highlights from the game Sunday. It was 10-7 at the break, and then Niall Davis goes 99 yards coast to coast to start the second half. Griffin, how big was this play for the Chiefs? Well, to start the second half, it was a huge momentum swing, and you see Niall Davis, what he does there. Great vision finding the hole, slippery, and then he just is able to turn it on. Not the speed that Jamal Charles has, but the vision, the ability to find the hole, and he does what he does best is be a utility player, step up. He's got four touchdowns this year. Charles carried it 13 times in this game for 73 yards. None more impressive than this run right here. This is a vintage Jamal Charles run, just hitting right through the hole using his speed and his power to get right through. This is what you want to see if you're the Chiefs from Jamal Charles. And back to the hammer again. It's Davis from three yards out, and it's officially a route 34-7. Chiefs as they get above 500 for the first time this season. Now, Griffin, we saw a bunch of offense and special teams there in the highlights, but how big was the defense on Sunday? Well, the defense kind of spoke for itself in its own way. 200 yards of total offense they gave up. They had seven sacks, three of them by Justin Houston, who, by the way, leads the NFL with 10 sacks. I mean, this is a defense that is – getting better and better every week and it's vintage Andy Reid about going into the bye week struggling coming out and it's like he has a new team and the defense is how you show that and how good they've been in these last two games 
This is the exact defense the Chiefs need if they're planning on making the playoffs. And you mentioned Andy Reid after a bye week. Incredible, has a fantastic record well, coming out of the break. You saw it uh, against San Diego two weeks ago, and, and, and the play has continued well against um, St. Louis, who actually beat Seattle the week before. Now it's Jets, Buffalo, and then that Seattle squad, uh, that's a Monday or Sunday night game, and then Oakland in the next four weeks for the Chiefs. Where do you see, uh, with the Chiefs currently at four and three, where do you see them in about a month from now? In one month, I would definitely see them going three and one in that stretch of games. So what would that be? Seven and four. It's good would math. Be right? After a month, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm struggling there with that. No, that's good. Yeah, seven and four. Um, yeah, I really see that. They have a combined. Their opponents in the next four games have a combined record of ten and twenty. They play two teams with a winning record right now, and Seattle's only one game over 500. The Jets and Raiders, you have to come out with wins. Those teams have one win between the two of them. The Jets, they're a mess at quarterback, and the Raiders are just a mess. Period. <laughs> so. They need to come out with two wins from that. The Bills, they have a little bit of their own situation at quarterback, and that's a team that I'm not confident in because they play in a pretty weak division. They played a weak schedule, mm -hmm. so I'm not confident in them being a good 5-3. and three. Seattle's the only game that I would be concerned with. Um, but they haven't looked great all season either. The, okay, this is true. This is true. They, they look good against Carolina for the most part. The offense didn't look great. That's the game I'd be concerned with. If the Chiefs can come out 3-1, and one, or better yet, 4-0, and oh, which is certainly possible, yes. that's going to be a huge, huge momentum swing for them in terms of getting the division because the Chargers we're now seeing have some clear weaknesses. Yes, the Chargers um, really kind of blown out, uh, too, against uh, the Broncos on Thursday. That's our Chiefs insider, Griffin Hughes. Dynamite as usual. We will be back after a quick break. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back into Good Morning KU. I'm Griffin Hughes, and here with me to talk about uh, a lecture series that's going on at the Lead Center and the guests that we have tonight at 7.30, we have Rachel Hagren and Cassandra Osei. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. Now, Rachel, you know all about the history of this lecture series and, and what it means and what people learn from it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, Jana Mackey herself was a student at KU. Um, she was a women's studies major. She graduated with a women's studies degree. Um, and she, during her time at KU, she was involved with Gotta Be Safe Center, um, with the organization I'm involved in called Surge. Then it was called the Commission on the Status of Women. Um, she was a law student. She was 25 years old when she was murdered by her ex-boyfriend. Um, this is something that I think really rocked the community. Um, it was a big tragedy. Um, and out of it, uh, with the help of her parents and different community members, has come the Jana Mackey Lecture Series um, as, as a part of a bigger campaign called the uh, Janice Campaign. But the Lecture Series is here at KU every year during October. Um, we'll invite a speaker um, to talk about uh, domestic violence in a broader context and especially trying to give an idea of uh, what we can do, all of us as students, not just highly involved students, but everyone, what we can do to help combat domestic violence. Very nice. How long has that been going on? Oh, I don't know. Um, do you know? I think about seven or six years. Yeah. All right. Okay. Now, Cassandra, the speaker tonight uh, is Melissa Harris-Perry. She is the host of MSNBC's Melissa Harris-Perry. She's also the founding director of the Anna Julia Cooper Center, so she's coming in tonight. Talk a little bit about her and what she's going to talk about tonight. Yeah, um, Melissa Harris-Perry is a full professor at Wake Forest University. She used to be um, a professor at Tulane University. As you said, she has her own show on MSNBC. And um, she's in the discipline of political science, but her work focuses on women's issues, particularly women of color. Um, and I think her lecture tonight is notable because um, it speaks about sexual assault, but as a person who experienced sexual assault herself, um, she will be speaking towards the intersections of sexual assault, 
women of color's issues and invisibility of those women. So she is also the author of two books on, like you said, African-American and, and gender studies, as well as some stereotypes. Is that going to be a big subject that she's going to talk about and how that would play into a domestic violence situation, some of the stereotypes of African-American and women? I believe so because, um, especially with women of color, their issues regarding sexual assault are hidden. Mm -hmm. So a stereotype could be, oh, as a community, black women don't face sexual assault, or Asian women don't face sexual assault, or indigenous women don't face sexual assault, but amongst those communities, they tend to have the highest rate of sexual assault. Um, and so sp putting that out there, making it more visible, I think will be a huge topic of discussion in her lecture. So let's finally touch on the timing of the lecture. Why is this date, October 27th, just the time of the lecture, why is that significant to the content, the domestic violence? Why, why is the timing significant? Uh, well, you know, um, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So just trying to have those conversations now, uh, we need to have them at some point. And, you know, this is an appropriate time that's been chosen. Especially considering what has been going on on campus. Yeah. I think it adds to the conversation and pushes the conversation yeah. forward. All right, well, once again, Melissa Harris-Perry tonight at the Lead Center at 7.30. Rachel Cassandra, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And thank you. coming up next, we've got Gabby Naylor, who is with Sean Jones to talk about the KU Dance Marathon, so stay with us. Okay. Welcome back. I'm Gabby Naylor, and I'm here with Sean Jones of KU Dance Marathon. Welcome, Sean. Hi, thanks for having me. Good. So Saturday, we had the big KU Dance Marathon event here in the Union. Tell me about it. How'd it go? Um, well, it went pretty great. Um, we raised six, over $63,000, which is the best we've ever done. So um, hats off to like our sponsors and all the students who came out to support uh, Children's Miracle Network, specifically KU Pediatrics. So we're basically raising money for KU. Cool. Were those kids that we were raising money here, were, how were they on Saturday? Were they here? Um, we had about 20 families come out, which was great. Um, so uh, a lot of the students got to see directly like who we impacted, and the kids had a great time as always. Um, they got to like meet a lot of different organizations. Um, the KU soccer team came out, Big J came, uh, Baby J as well. And also just um, getting to meet with the students was a great opportunity for the kids. That's really cool. So tell me exactly how the event was structured. I know it went from 10 to 10, but give me some more details. Um, yeah, it's a 10 for 10, um, or 10 to 10, so it's a 12-hour event where we stand on our feet, basically um, symbolizing we stand for the kids who can't. And so um, you also wear a hospital bracelet, which we cut off at the end. Well, the kids get to cut off us at the end of the uh, marathon, basically, to say, um, you know, you're done with um, your fight to stand, but we are not done. So hopefully one day that they can cut off theirs and never look back. Yeah, I was there right for that last closing ceremony, and I think that it broke me down a little bit. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. I loved it. Definitely. So how would someone um, get involved moving forward with KU Dance Marathon? Well, we're always looking for people to um, help us with our leadership. So um, executive director applications are actually due this Friday, so Halloween. Um, just go to KUDM.org, and you can um, sign up there um, for other steering positions or committee um, positions. Look out for those also to become live on KUDM.org. Cool. All right. That's really exciting. Again, we have Sean Jones, the Sierra of KU Dance Marathon. And right after this break, we'll be back with the weather in the news. Where you go to college makes a statement about you. This place will become a part of you, your identity for life. The University of Kansas, a great place to be you. I'm Jack Caldwell. And I'm Andrew Shepard. This is your Monday Good Morning KU News Update. A second Washington State High School shooting victim has died. 14-year-old Gia Soriano died Sunday night, raising the tragic count to two dead and three injured. According to CNN, alleged shooter Jalen Freiberg opened fire in the crowded lunchroom at Marysville Pelchuk High School on Friday before taking his own life. Soriano had been in critical condition since the tragedy. Marcelo Marquez, a suspect in a California shooting spree, has been deported to Mexico twice according to the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement. 
According to CNN, Marquez killed two sheriff's deputies in two counties, wounded a third deputy, attempted three carjackings, and shot a driver in the head. Marquez had been previously arrested and convicted in Arizona for narcotics possession in 1997, facing deportation then and again in 2001. Boko Haram has kidnapped at least 30 boys and girls in northeast Nigeria. The gunmen have continually terrorized the Borno state region, leading to an exodus of residents. Last week, Boko Haram kidnapped 60 women and girls in Adamawa State, according to CNN. The gunmen previously kidnapped 219 schoolgirls in April, who still have not yet been found. Westport shooting victim Ronald Shelton of Kansas City died early Sunday morning. The shooting occurred at about 1.50 a.m. at 40th Street and Pennsylvania Avenue. The 39-year-old Shelton was not the only victim, as another man was shot in the arm, but is expected to survive. According to the Kansas City Star, the tragedy began in an argument followed by a shooting. While Royals and Giants fans are celebrating the excitement and drama of the World Series, St. Louis fans are mourning the loss of one of the Cardinals' top young players. In the middle of Game 5 last night, MLB officials announced that 22-year-old Oscar Tavares had been killed in a car accident. Tavares had played in the NL Championship Series just two weeks ago and was home in the Dominican Republic where the accident occurred. The past four Kansas basketball coaches will be together tonight to commemorate 60 years of KU's basketball in Allen Fieldhouse. Ted Owens, Larry Brown, Roy Williams, and Bill Self will gather on Naismith Court to celebrate college basketball's most historic venue. According to the UDK, ESPN college basketball analyst Jay Billis will serve as a master of ceremony. The event is sold out. And that'll wrap it up for today's news update. Stick around for after the break. Griffin and Lane will be back with the weather. Talk about the weather. Lane, it looks like a pretty good day today. How is it today? Hey Griffin, actually it's really nice out this morning. It's a little bit cloudy um, as you might be able to tell here, but it's about uh, 66 degrees this morning. Um, it should be uh, constant temperatures throughout the rest of the week and uh, specifically for tomorrow for game six of the World Series uh, should be about 66 degrees, partly cloudy as well for the first pitch. Well, possibly the most important sporting event in Kansas City history, I don't know. I'm not the one to talk about that. How are we looking for the rest of the week in terms of clouds, temperature? What are we looking at? It's going to be pretty constant the rest of the week, about you know uh, high 50s, low 60s. It uh, should be about partly cloudy, a little bit sunny. Um, it probably, we don't have a chance of rain until about Sunday, so it should be nice this entire week. All right, awesome. Lane, thank you so much for joining us. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you, thank you for tuning in to Good Morning KU. Join us again tomorrow where we'll have an all-new show. Thanks again. Have a great day.